Hello, my name is Chandler Smith with Precision Measurement Engineering, and joining me from Maine today is Vendi Hazukova. Vendi, how are you doing? Nice to meet you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm a PhD student at the University of Maine, and I work with Dr. Jasmine Saras, and we are doing some limnology work in the Arctic in West Greenland. We are studying several lakes, and we are looking at various aspects and how are they changing in response to climate change. Just to kind of give a little preface here, we're going to be talking today about the mini dot and the mini part and how that's helped Vendi. Uh, the mini dot is an instrument to uh, measure both dissolved oxygen temperature and the mini par is uh, was created to measure photosynthetically active radiation. Radiation, it's a bit of a mouthful, so we'll, we'll just call it mini par. Um, but uh, Vendi, I'd love to learn about your research and, and how these two products have helped you. Uh, as I said before, typically, uh, we've done a case study with the researcher prior to doing uh, the interview, but in this case, we have not. Uh, so I'll be learning the, the basics from where she's gone, how she deployed them, uh, and how they've helped uh, how they helped her with her research. Um, but ju just to kind of give a little background, could you get, dive a little bit more into what type of researcher research you're trying to conduct with the mini dot and mini par? So primarily, we are trying to focus on how is lake metabolism responding to changes over the course of the season? How are these lakes active, whether they are heterotrophic or autotrophic? So whether they are consuming oxygen or releasing oxygen and hence affecting carbon cycling, how is that changing, uh, whether they're active on the ice, which obviously lakes in the Arctic are covered with ice for a really long time. And we don't really know what exactly is happening. And considering that climate change is ongoing and it is really amplified in the Arctic, uh, it is of high urgency to figure out what is happening under ice and how these lakes might change with ice decreasing in duration. You said that you guys were working out in Greenland. Is there any specific reason why you guys chose that location? It's, it's a little bit out of the way, especially being located out in Maine. Yeah. So we are working in Greenland because my advisor has a long-term project going on there and monitoring that is going back into early 2010s. So we do have some idea about how these lakes are behaving over time, which is really important to place these more short-term experiments into context. And so we work in West Greenland, which is a very peculiar part of Arctic because it is very dry and the precipitation is extremely low. And also the, the ice-free margins where we are working uh, in between the coast and the Greenland ice sheet has been deglaciated fairly recently. So it's not an area where you have very deep permafrost. So it is not necessarily affected by, let's say permafrost thaw slumps. And the lakes are uh, quite different from those that other researchers are studying in the Arctic elsewhere, like in Alaska or some places in Siberia. So it provides a unique ecosystem where to study changes and responses to climate change because we can find other dry ecosystems elsewhere in the Arctic, for example, in the Yukon Flats. So it would be really useful to get a hand on how these systems are responding especially as they are getting drier and drier over time and warmer and warmer. I'm curious as to why you have chosen the mini dot and the mini par for, for this research. Um, it, it sounds like where you guys are deploying these instruments is you know, quite taxing. I mean, it, it, it's going under the ice in an Arctic area. Um, is there anything that, you know, kind of the mini dot or mini par kind of jumped out at you that, that made you think these were good for, for your, uh, your type of research? So what we really appreciate about these uh, pieces of products is that they are fairly small and really useful for long-term deployment, which is something we are really interested in because we have to hike in the spots. So if something weighs, you know, 20 kilos, oh it, 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 every gram counts. and Oh yeah. So I think that that's really the main importance and being able to get really high frequency measurements of oxygen and light under the eyes and underwater is necessary for us to be able to calculate some of the calculations uh, that go into 
assessing like metabolism and how it changes over time. Uh, so you mentioned having to hike out to these areas, which already makes me tired just thinking about it. Um, I'm curious as to the uh, deployment strategy that you guys have. A, a lot of our customers ask us how, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to deploy it in this area or under these conditions. How would you go about doing that? So I, I'm curious about your guys' strategy as to how you're going to get it under the ice or it. Uh, what's your guys' kind of uh, uh, strategy there? So with the eyes come quite different conditions. And if we want these sensors to be all right in the spring when we want to retrieve them or later in the summer, we have to make sure that they are not in contact with the ice. So as the ice melts, they wouldn't be dragged all over the lake and we can actually find them after the ice is gone. So what we do, right. actually, we, we hack in and we drill a hole in the ice uh, with, an, with a hand auger. And obviously, it, in the Arctic, it's pretty cold. So the ice can be thick as it's more than a one meter thick. So that can take a while. And wow. because we, we are attaching the sensors on a string that is ended with a buoy. So the sensors are vertically hanging in the water column and we can adjust where exactly are they uh, located within the water column and usually we try to deploy them about one meter below the ice or expected thickness of ice so we really reduce the possibility of the buoys getting entrenched and frozen within the ice cover and usually we have to drill multiple holes because some of the pieces of equipment are a little bit wider uh, than the, the hole that we can drill. So we have to drill multiple of them kind of in a, in a like a clover shape. So the, the, yeah. the hole is wide enough for us to, to just put it down. <laughs> so uh, I'm curious, really quick, how long are these being deployed for in, in between retrieving them? Quick question. Yeah. So we deployed them in 2019 in April on their ice and we retrieved them at the beginning of July. So April, May, June, July, four months. Okay. Uh, so I'm not super familiar with, with really like tundry, you know, snowy areas. Um, you mentioned being concerned that they may float around. You may not be able to find them. I'm assuming the, the top layer also changes with, with weather and things of that nature. You said there was low precipitation, but there might be high winds. Um, I'm curious how you guys end up finding that the same area that you drilled before. Is there some type of flag that you guys leave or, or some type of indication that won't be destroyed through weather? So what we usually do is that we just take a GPS coordinates and oh, okay. just, just hope we'll be able to find it again in the, in the summer <laughs> and that they won't move anywhere in the sediment. So uh, it's also pretty good to know the bathymetry of the lake. So we don't put them on some shelf where they could easily slip down and, and, and move, I don't know, several meters down. So we are trying to find a, a fairly deep spot where they won't be able to really move anywhere. And we are obviously trying to prevent them from entrenching in the ice because that, would, that could drag them around. And so far we had a very good luck. We are deploying these sensors in the Arctic but also we've deployed some of these here in Maine. And sometimes, um, so the trouble with retrieving them uh, is first the coordinates could change over time because they're moving around. But second, um, if we are deploying them on the ice, uh, the water levels are changing, right? So in the spring, the water level is usually higher with all the melt and the sensors can be a little bit deeper than when we deployed them before. So it can get a little bit harder to see them. Even though we put large buoys on them that are, you know, they have color, they're orange or white. Uh, when they get a little bit too deep or when the day is windy, it's almost impossible to find them. So we just have to try again on a calmer day and just look carefully. Sometimes it takes a long time to find them, but in Greenland, because the lakes are extremely clear, 
we had the great luck and usually we type in the coordinates in the summer, we paddle there and we can see it immediately. So it's been working out pretty well in Greenland. Oh, that's awesome. That's really cool. Um, so I, I, we kind of got like a general idea of what your research is about. I'm curious as to how the mini par and mini dot specifically help you. So let's try and first understand uh, your experience with the mini dot and, and what type of data are you trying to pull? Are, are you looking for anything? Do you have a high, hypothesis that the mini dot is helping to prove or disprove? Um, well, let's go ahead and start with the mini dot and how it's helped you. So we are, well, first of all, we are looking at the data by themselves. So having an idea, what is the oxygen profile uh, in the epilimnion in the upper layer of the lake? And what is the oxygen profile over time in the bottom layers is quite interesting by itself. And we are using it kind of as, a, as auxiliary data to put other variables that we are collecting in context. So we also collect data on phytoplankton, zooplankton, and nutrients. So it allows us to understand changes in these variables. But uh, the, I think the, the more important part of what we are trying to figure out is the changes in like metabolism. And the high frequency oxygen measurements um, allow us to understand how is photosynthesis and respiration, ecosystem respiration changing over time? And for that, we, we do really need a high frequency data because we are using measurements that are taken during the day as we are making the assumption that no photosynthesis is happening during the night. So then we can compare the night measurements of oxygen and the daily measurements of oxygens and the fluctuations to figure out whether photosynthesis is prevailing or whether respiratory processes and oxygen consumption is happening. And we would see that in the comparison between uh, decreases and increases that are happening at daily basis in the water column. Does it make sense, kind of? Yeah, absolutely. And with with your explanation about your need for the mini dot, I can now begin to understand the necessity for the mini par as well. Yes. You're, you'll you'll have you'll have to understand how much light is coming through and see how that's affecting the lake. And you can tell you can understand that better by the high frequency data that you're getting from the mini dot. Yes, exactly. So we do need uh, the underwater par data that we can pair, couple with these high frequency of oxygen data, and also to calculate um, the gas fluxes between atmosphere and the water. We also need wind speed data, and but that's terrestrial okay. and a different part of the story. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Do you guys, uh, I'm curious if you guys have some type of station, you said your advisor has been doing long-term studies at Greenland already. I'm curious if you guys have any type of terrestrial PAR sensing that you guys have at a station maybe that you can compare with data that you're retrieving from under the water or once again, I, I haven't read any case or anything like that. So I, I am just really curious if you guys are comparing any data or just pulling what, what you get from the mini PAR. That's something what we really want to do in the future, probably okay. next field season, if it's possible, because if we have two points where we are measuring for PAR, it allows us to calculate light extinction throughout the water column and calculate with fairly high precision, uh, what is the light at different depths and so far, we only we were only able to use one mini par per lake, and but we are also coupling mini par and mini dot with hobo sensors that also measure temperature okay. and light, and we are using them at every meter, so we can calculate uh, thermal stratification and changes in temperature in the lake, and so using those, you know, cheaper sensors but not that precise. We, we can use them to, to look at the light extinction coefficients, but it is not great. It was, we were just kind of, you know, in a pilot mode of the study and we we're trying to figure out what we really need to, to get 
good measurements. So I think in the future we will have to um, equip the lakes at least with one sensor outside the lake as well to really get what is the surface irradiance at the spot. It sounds pretty pretty impressive work, especially it, it, we're we're talking about all of this and then imagine being in the Arctic as well. <laughs> yeah, it's a tough environment to work in. I can I can assume, right? And there is, I guess, a, a, a funny thing is that when they are deploying things outside from the lakes, you also have to think about um, the herbivores that are there, and there is a lot of musk oxen. And they like to kind of rub themselves around any kind of structure because there's really no trees. So uh. um, if, if you erect something in the in the terrestrial area, it has to be really anchored pretty well so the muskoxen just don't destroy it completely. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be the worst to, to deploy something, wait for four months for data and come out and realize that somebody used your instrument as a back scratcher. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thousand dollar back scratcher <laughs> <laughs> well um I, i'm curious before before we uh, i let you go and enjoy the rest of your day um i'm curious about your just baseline uh impression of the devices have they worked well for you are you happy with them is there anything we can improve on yeah we've been really happy with the sensors because they're really easy to use and when we are deploying these sensors for a long time, especially for PAR, the functionality of the wipers is super important. And it's been amazing. We take all these sensors out from the water after four months and the Lycor sensor is completely clear. Although the, the rest of the sensor is covered you know, in algae and all sorts of growth. So the wipers work perfectly. And we've replicated that they work great even here in Maine and across all the study lakes. So that was, that's really great. Well, good, I'm glad. And I totally forgot to to touch on uh, fouling. And so typically when you think about fouling, you think of warmer waters as a, a, a catalyst for the growth of biofouling. Um, we're talking about Arctic waters. And just as you said, it seems like even though we're talking cold water, we're still seeing quite a bit of biofouling. Is there any reason why that may be? I'm curious. Even though the lakes are fairly cold water and very low nutrients, there is still phytoplankton growing. You can still see diatom growth. And that is likely because there's just populations that are adapted to those conditions and are able to take advantage of, you know, new surface that exists. So, we are also monitoring phytoplankton and zooplankton communities. And there's definitely, it, it is really like a highly dynamical system, even though it's cold and low nutrients. Although I, can a, a pretty... if, I bet if you compare the biofiling amount, I don't know, from Lake Mendota and these lakes in Greenland, it will look very differently. And, um, when we do deploy some of these sensors here in Maine in a little bit higher nutrient system, we can see that just the biofouling communities are different, but all the sensors always get slimy. <laughs> <laughs> so no matter what lake you're in, no matter you know what type of fouling there is, it seems like a wiper is, is definitely appreciated. Working, yes. <laughs> Bendy, thank you so much for taking a little bit of time out of your day to talk with me. Um, your your work sounds really amazing. You get to travel to Greenland, which I've heard is a very, very beautiful place. Uh, it sounds like you're doing very important work uh, for our understanding of climate change and how that's affecting some pretty incredible ecosystems. So thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much as well. <laughs> I hope it was useful yeah. a little bit. Oh, absolutely. All right. You have a good rest of your day, okay? Thank you. Have a good day. Bye.